I don't understand why, why he says he has such a long flight. I had to come all the way from Madrid, you know, it was a really long <laughs> train. It was, it was pretty hard. No, but uh, Philip, it's, um, it's really super to meet you, honestly, because uh, um, I've been following what you've been doing as from the beginning, and we actually never got the chance to meet, so I think now it's, we do. It's, yeah, it's a really special, uh, special moment. And, um, and I mean, one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to understand is, uh, I want to spend some time on high fidelity, I don't want us to spend too much time on Second Life, but I think it is important that you know we have, uh, you know, we're fortunate enough that you're the pioneer of what today we know we're calling you know virtual worlds and all that, and you're a pioneer now in VR and all that. So I'd love to at least understand uh, how Second Life came to be. Why did you get into that crazy, completely crazy thing, and then and then and then kind of the lessons from that, and then we can transition to high fidelity maybe. You know, I've, I read a book on the plane that I hadn't finished called The Rise of the Machines, and it was a book about, started with cybernetics from Norman uh, Wiener in the 1940s, talking about machines that would ultimately become sort of appendages of humans, you know, and this, this book had a big section, and it reminded me about how this dream of the sort of metaverse or the dream of online worlds really has been going on for a long time, and it's just been a matter of making it fit the technology of the time or the medium. You know, there are things like uh, Habitat, which was this project. I mean, some people here probably remember Habitat. It was like a Commodore 64 bitmap, you know, graphics thing, side-scrolling, but it was a big open virtual world with thousands of people in it, and it was one of the first pioneering investigations into this idea of could you build you know, another society in another world uh, on the computer. So I think of Second Life as moon. I, I was always passionate about doing exactly that, you know, building as big a world as I could. Um, and I think the unique thing about Second Life was perhaps just that you know, I really attacked the technology that we had at the time, which was 2000 when I started the company, the broadband computers yeah. with OK 3D. Uh, the, the 3D uh, card that came out, the GeForce 2, was one of the reasons that I started the company at the time that I did in 1999. I thought maybe there was a chance of making actually a three-dimensional world with terrain and long horizons, something that could be done you know, at that time. But it's but, a perpetual idea. But you went way beyond that. I mean, you went way beyond just doing a 3D place where people could hang out. I mean, there's... There was a whole economy. I mean, there was almost, you know, virtual currency before you know, blockchain was a thing. I mean, there was. There we was, were the there, first. There was yeah. all of that. So, so um, yeah. why did you build that? And what yeah. were the challenges around building that? And, and and quite honestly, I mean, how how did you manage to do it? Well, I mean, I, I think the managed was it was a great time for technology and technology development. That is kind of the early 2000s. It was great people available. I was, able to, uh, I was able to raise a little money for it and put a little money in myself at the beginning, so we had a real startup. You know, we were able to hire a good number of really great people. Had some amazing innovators that helped with the engineering of Second Life that have gone on to do remarkable things in their own careers now. Um, yeah, you know, that economy, touching on that, I'd, I always felt I had less of a sort of a gaming approach to the, my own dream of the virtual world and more of a builder's approach. It felt to me that there had to be a lot of freedom to build things that were interesting. You, you should be able to build things that were visually interesting and interactively interesting. And then I felt from the very beginning, uh, even when I, before we started working on any, any of it, I had this dream that you needed to be able to buy and sell these interesting things. The, the, the whole matrix of the thing or the mesh that would hold it all together would be economic exchange amongst different people for small things. So yeah, it was like I was, tr I was wanting something like blockchain and something like Bitcoin, but long before its time, uh, because I wanted something that would allow people in different countries, because of course, you know, Second Life grew to be pretty big, and so it is the same as the global internet, so lots of people in every country. The United States, where it was born, represented only about a 30% share of the usage. So, and then, you know, that's what we saw. So I knew that we needed something where you could move a small amount of money between two people who probably weren't in the same country, and especially at that time, certainly didn't have a payment system in common. There wasn't even, you know, PayPal wasn't as big, and many of the other systems, uh, such as Venmo, or, you know, certainly all the wonderful systems in China that we have now, they, they didn't exist. So I just had to come up with something that, so that I could buy the shirt from you and wear it myself. But, but what I think what very few people realize and understand is even today, and Second Life is still going, it's still, still around, 
it's actually, I think it's $700 million yeah. economy per year. Yeah. Six or $700 million a year in yeah. transactions between people. The amazing thing is how much we learned about how creative people are and what kinds of things people want to buy and sell. Uh, you know, clothing and hair. Hair is like the most popular thing uh, as a single industry, I think, inside Second Life. But yeah, this very big economy, almost, you know, closing in on a billion dollars a year. Uh, and that's about a million people that are doing it. So you, it's also quite a lot of money uh, per person per year uh, happening. And how key do you think uh, was the fact that you could, I don't know if that's the case, but actually almost make a living out of that? Yeah. I mean, you could basically, you could, and I think that actually is, a lot of companies are struggling with today, so you could actually turn, and I think you can still turn your lead-in dollars into yeah. actual dollars pretty you, seamlessly. You absolutely can, uh, and it's actually an open exchange, which is yeah. like what we have with blockchain currencies today. Yeah. It's, a, it's an exchange where the company doesn't actually uh, give you back dollars for your dollars. What the company does is kind of match you up with somebody else who wants to buy those dollars from you, so it's actually a... Okay. Technically, it's a full foreign exchange system. And now, before we fast forward to iFidelity, what do you think Second Life, at one point in, you know, in 2006, 2007, it was all over the press, everybody was yeah. talking about it, it was this huge thing. I think every single person who had a computer at the time who was interested in tech at least tried it once. Why do you think it is a success, but it didn't become didn't massive? Get yeah, it didn't get bigger. Maybe it wasn't enough of a game. I mean, there's a lot of people yeah. here, and you and I talked about that yesterday. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't enough of a game. Um, it could be. Uh, as I was saying, Second Life does have some uh, small games that have been built inside it, but it really didn't fundamentally allow you to uh, level up or uh, collect in a way that was game-like. And maybe that was a mistake in retrospect. I, um, my background is in physics and engineering and compression and things like that. And so I didn't, honestly, I just didn't think that much about um, mm -hmm. making it kind of fundamentally more game-like. So that could be. I, but I think also, and I think we're going to see this in the real world in AR and VR as this all plays out. There was a choice you made when you went into Second Life, which was kind of to leave the world behind. And I think that choice is sort of uh, fundamental in a way. And... I think that we'll, we're going to see that. I, when I think of many things that we're now doing in VR, things that we did in Second Life, you sort of had this comparison, you, you, you had this competition between that place and the real world. And for example, people that were in big cities like New York or Los Angeles or London or here, they actually tended to use Second Life less per capita. This is not surprising, right? Because your real life was very busy and interesting and involved. And, and you know, if you're in New York, you kind of almost are an avatar, you know, you can look like anything and, you know, you have great freedom and, you know, all these things. So I think in a way, uh, Second Life and virtual worlds as well are going to be these new countries or places that are fundamentally uh, a, a difficult choice in some ways. Like to, in, we're, as humans, we only have so much time to invest in things like our job. And so if you're going to have a job in a virtual world, that, well, that's your job. That's your one job. So I think maybe one of the things is just that it's a rocky transition and, you know, uh, the choice to spend time in Second Life is a, you know, it's a four-hour-a-day choice, which okay. is a big one. So now let's hitchhike <laughs> through the metaverse to high fidelity. Yeah. Um, so VR. Yeah. It gets a... It's, 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 trou it's troubling times for VR, it's right? It's not time, really right? getting a super... I mean, do you think Ready yeah. Player One was good for VR or it just put Love people's expectations book. too high? Or yeah. what do you think? Love the book. One of the first demonstrations... I went and showed our earliest work at High Fidelity to Ernest Klein because I was such a fan of the book, you know? And I went and tracked him down and put the headset on him. And my co-founder, Ryan, was like, hello, Ernest, you know, as an avatar on the other side of the headset live, and, and he was like, okay, that's pretty crazy. Uh, so I love, I think that book did so much for the industry and the excitement behind it. I think the film, unfortunately, by taking away one of the key backstory pieces, mm -hmm. which was education, right? Yeah. I think all of us who have read the book, right? Yeah. Well, maybe all of us were inspired by the fact that the idea behind the thing was that there was a base value to the Oasis, which was learning that the world was so screwed up that everybody was going to school with a headset on. And I believe that that's still one of the big impacts for VR. One of the, and this is a probably a contentious thing to say here, but yeah. I think one of the problems with VR is that it's focusing on gaming. Mm -hmm. 
which is a very, very different, there's so much good work being done in gaming, there's so many two-dimensional experiences with gaming that are just unbelievably great. Why would you take a new medium like VR and immediately shotgun it right at such a rich and well-developed industry as gaming? And so what we're seeing with VR is it's making very slow inroads into gaming. Um, uh, it, it, certainly the Oculus Quest is the best device that's come out, it's lovely, um, but we're still gonna see slow impact and slow inroads. But I think people need to pull the camera back, talk about the metaverse, right, and say, what is the metaverse? Why does it exist? What's it for, right? It's not, it's, I mean, okay, yes, it's for gaming, but I don't think it's like fundamentally like a game because its impact on education, for example, is crazy. I mean, education is gonna change forever once we have headsets we can wear all day. Education will change forever. Why would you possibly go to school within 10 miles of your house yeah. when you could go to school with someone like you and learn about uh, you know, investing in and thinking about gaming mm -hmm. from this person who is 6,000 miles away? Of course people are going to go to class and listen to you. They're not going to go. So, so, so one of the things that made me, made me think about what you're saying uh, is, and, and I watched some of the videos and all that, is actually I'm a bit disappointed that we're doing this in person right now because normally when you do a fireside chat, you're actually we not do, there, right? We do them, yeah. It's you, amazing. You, you're doing it with, you know, with, the, with, with the virtual uh, characters and all that. How does that feel? Well, it feels pretty good, better than you might think. So the amazing thing is that you can hear the audience. So uh, we're talking about in high fidelity, we do these face-to-face, uh, -face, these fireside chats, which are just like this, but we put everybody in full body tracking with the Vive trackers, and I sit down with a fascinating person like you, I'd love to have you on there, and we talk about whatever we feel like, and it's completely virtual, and I can look in your eyes, and there's very low latency. It's not as good as this, but it's pretty darn close. And for the people, by the way, in the back of the hall, uh -huh. the performance of high fidelity is about that good. So it's what, that. What about the one that's sleeping there? Could I, could I <laughs> exactly. see that? Exactly. Clearly, yeah. we failed. <laughs> <laughs> I would notice that in virtual reality as well. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, we, we did a bunch of work on getting 500 people in a room, which is what we can do with high fidelity. Uh, we're the only company that's made that kind of technology progress. Um, and the sensation of it is fantastic, more when you turn to the audience and you see them nodding or looking at you or they raise their hand to ask a question, which if they have headsets on, they can do all that. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that you're right. Uh, events, conferences, of course we're going to do them with VR headsets on as soon as we can. Unfortunately, the VR headsets are, as you said, it's a rocky time for VR. The hype curve on it was like second life, you know, the hype curve was unbelievable. And so you couldn't possibly live up to it. And you know, now we're kind of getting through that. But I focus more on, we've just got to get these headsets good enough to let teachers teach and to let meetings happen in VR. And then you're going to see an impact for VR that is very positive and very significant for the world, very green. You know, not getting on an airplane to come here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, as you know, the carbon impact of that is unbelievably high. So, so one of the things that, that you told me that were key to, to adoption of VR and, and, and one of the reasons, maybe other than the devices getting cumbersome and all that, uh, you know, for it kind of holding back VR, was um, a lot of people have been focusing on bringing you, bringing you to environments or very solo experiences. Yeah. But what you're saying, what really is the clincher, what makes the difference, and what people look for, people want to belong to communities, people don't want to be with other people. So what really is the clincher is when you focus your efforts on putting people together that are far apart. Can you, can you develop on that idea? Yeah, I mean, part of why I wanted to do High Fidelity at the time that we started, which was really when it became obvious that the VR headsets might work, um, was that I felt that body language and the ability to communicate more naturally, make eye contact, um, would be something that would be enabled by the headsets uniquely and that you would feel present with a person. And of course, also, you would feel communion, a connection with someone else that was even more powerful than what you feel with something like Second Life. But, but Second Life was the starting point for that because when you see your avatar next to another person's avatar, it's like holding a doll and holding it next to the other person's doll. You feel close to them when you do that. Uh, and so there's a very powerful sense of connection uh, and, and uh, the right kind of dependency, you know, when you're near somebody in VR, you're not going to yell at them. For example, we saw with Second Life that people, we just had a wonderful panel, the last panel here was talking about, uh, among other things, you know, moderation and how to keep people acting civil to each other. Well, just the fact that you have an avatar and you're in the room with somebody else immediately makes you act very civil because you feel 
like this, and I'm not going to yell obscenities at you uh, when I'm this close to you. You know, it's not going to happen. And so I think that VR has the potential to uh, deepen the sense of real human uh, connection and presence, and that's something that we need because there are ways to reach people at a great distance, but they're all pretty unhuman, inhuman. And so is it, can I challenge that? I mean, is that really what's going to happen? Because, of course, some of the things that... that and, and I think in, in another talk you mentioned, you know, like, um, if, you know, if Oculus did this and Facebook went into this, then, you know, nobody wants to walk out, walk around in virtual reality with their, basically, their Facebook name on top of their head. You right. know, you want to have the kind of anonymous feeling and all that. But we also know that when you're anonymous, you behave in certain ways. I mean, there's a copycat of Second Life that was very famous for having, you know, flying penises everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there's... Uh, that was in Second Life. That was, was in that Second, in Second Life. Life. I thought it was a copycat of Second Life. No, okay, so you were the one with the flying penises. We, okay. we had the deal with the flying penises. <laughs> that was a famous uh, entrepreneur, Anche Chung, who graced the cover of Business Week in 2005. She had like a press conference or something in World. Okay. And it was like a, it was like a fireside chat. And somebody was griefing in the back of the room, and they rained down penises onto the, the, the uh, stage. <laughs> so, do you want to avoid flying penises in high fidelity? Or do you think, actually, that's fine? Well, if by, if by challenging me, you mean, yes, could it be a bad outcome, uh, yeah. is what you mean, letting people in. I, I think it's a very serious concern, and I think that challenge is correct. Um, and I think there is some risk that we, I think there's some risk that we won't be able to design we collectively, not just high fidelity, won't be able to design worlds that make people civil. Um, but I think there's a real chance, though, that we will, that we can, um, and that we need to take it on. But you're right. Uh, I think that pseudonymous identity is very important because it empowers us. We talked about this in the last panel, you know, that being able to be an avatar that has a different name than yours and is not your Facebook name over your head, that empowers you. If you're marginalized or wanting to experiment with your identity in any way, you can't do it, obviously, if you're forced to staple your name over your head. But that does create this op problem, you know, that, that can we make people civil? I think that we can, and I think that we can do that by building uh, reputation systems. Now, of course, everybody says, like that Black Mirror episode, <laughs> we've seen the black nosedive. I think that's a negative look at what could be a positive outcome. I think there's a way to do a reputation. I think there's a way to do a kind of reputation, not just in virtual worlds, by the way, maybe even more generally, but I think there's a way to do reputation that can work. And we actually played, it's a long story, but we played a lot with that inside my company. When Second Life got bigger, and we were about 100 people, my CTO and I, who were tinkerers, we, you know, Corey and I just love to build crazy things like Second Life. And we said, what can we build that makes everybody happy at work and keeps us all connected as to what's going on? And we came up with this idea that we, we jokingly, well, we called it the love machine because we thought that was just such a great name and the name of a band in the 70s, I think. But uh, we built a system where you send only positive messages of recognition to your coworkers. But the deal is that everybody sees who sent it and who received it forever, and so it's kind of a public record, okay. like a blockchain record right yeah. now, nowadays. I think that something like that, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. That'd be it, interesting if Twitter was that way. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. What if, what if there was a way to make an opt-in thing where, yeah, you could say something nice about somebody and then they had to accept it or something so you couldn't grief them. I think there might be a way to do a public reputation system that was more positive, not, probably not a negative system. I can't imagine. And maybe without a negative system, we can't get a stable design, and so we're all screwed. But I have a feeling that it's at least worth trying something. And I, I, I bet that many of the game designers, maybe some of the people that are here, uh, are thinking about this already. But I have a feeling that some kind of a positively biased reputation system could be quite effective, even with pseudonymous identity. So. Thinking of going ma mass market you know, with virtual reality metaverses. Um, so you say that maybe um, uh, one of the mistakes with Second Life was you know, not taking games seriously, right? Or not really thinking of maybe you know, what, what we call the minute-to-minute -minute experience. You know, because I told you, you know, the minute-to-minute -minute experience in Second Life for a gamer sucks, Don't right? have it, yeah. yeah. Um, um, it has lots of great things, but not that. And then... You're saying again that for you're trying this again with VR in a di different way, and you're saying, well, actually, the market and the money and where we can read 
get mass adoption is in education, in replacing conferences, in stopping people from traveling and all that. And the gamer in me is thinking boring, 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 boring. Yeah, totally. Um, so how do you avoid making the same mistake again? Yeah. And I flip it around and almost maybe ask you the question or ask other people that are here. In VR especially, what is the one game that we all want to play? That's what I was thinking, because we have to be inclusive here. If this is something that's transformative, right? Yeah. And, and there's so much fiction around this, right? There's so, we all know a fictional story, there's a million of them, right? That is, everybody on Earth started playing this one game, and that's how the Matrix got made, right? I mean, that's, that trope is rich in our fiction. But what is that game? I is it Pokemon? It seems like maybe that's close, right? Like collecting something, but everybody wants to wander around the real world or something and collect things. So, so, so the thing that you said is, 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 is maybe, maybe the, the thing is that neither you or I would come up with it, but maybe someone from the audience here would, could come up with it. And one of the things that you explained is said, hey, you know, actually, what I like, the kind of game that I enjoy playing is maybe, you know, a beer drinking, Pong game, right. you know, in the virtual metaverse and all that. And, and my answer to you, yeah, but you're not going to develop that because it doesn't make sense. But if you open up the platform yeah. and then you let other people just build things in there and you let them play yeah. and you let them, do, a bit like a, we, and we, we had the example of Roblox and yeah, another one. Yeah, I was going to say, you were yeah. talking about that. Yeah. Roblox is just a monstrous success yeah. by, and uh, arguably, as we were talking about, by, by enabling some basic gaming principles and then allowing people to build, I mean, uh, 50 million or so different experiences based on that. But I, somehow I sense, though, that that all, again, you know, guide to the metaverse, somehow that all needs to connect together. And I don't know why, it's, it's, I kind of feel it like, you know, the matrix, you know, there's something in your head and you just can't, can't quite get it. It feels to me like all of these games, though, would need to connect together into a fabric, and I don't know exactly what that fabric looked like yet, but I want to. Yeah, because building on that, my kind of question, and there's a, maybe there's a few people here that are doing VR games or have tried to be do VR games and they're frustrated that there's not a huge market for it and all that. And what's really happened is like everyone's been doing kind of these VR games on, in isolation, right? And they're very, you know, I, even like I've, I've got the Oculus Quest. I was telling you this is the first device that I actually managed to get my wife to try, uh -huh. uh, which, is, which is a big deal. Then my kids play and there's all these games, but they're not... There's, there's not really connected, right? So do you think that the key is you actually need a unifying metaverse to all these games to make it work somehow? Or you think that the future is actually now there's going to be, you know, the super cool, the equivalent of Pokemon Go game for oh. VR that everybody's going to play and that's going to make people play? And what do you think is going to happen? Well, even you were mentioning the Quest. I think a lot of us would say about the Quest right now that mm. it's what's wrong with it, mm. even just looking at it as a short-form ga single-player gaming thing, what's wrong with it is you're going to keep the headset on while you download the next 400 megabyte thing that installs itself? I mean, it's ridiculous, right? You, you're not going to go from one experience to the next with a five to 10 minute delay between each one of them. Um, I feel like it's a little bit like the internet, right? The internet exploded with links and with the fact that you could go from one website to a similar but somewhat different website. So it feels to me like the metaverse has to be something like that. There has to be some concept of the hyperlink and there has to be some fairly lightweight, if any, loading process as you move from one experience to another. And then I think there's also the idea of these things like cities that, that have such appeal to us as humans. And cities are these recursively embedded things. A block with a certain character that's something district with a bunch of buildings, with a bunch of apartments, with a bunch of people in those apartments. It's like a recursive structure and we need to build some, something like that, at least some of the time, maybe a lot of the time. So, so would that mean that, and, and I mean, if you look at Ready Player One, you know, it's not like there's two or three or four different metaverses. There's one. Yeah, and which planets, is, right? You fly, right. fly from planet. And you planet. fly from planet to planet, but there's a unifying global experience. So do you think this is a one platform, winner takes all type? 
I mean, well, I don't think it's winner takes all because I think that yeah. the real economic activity, which and we saw this in Second Life too, like you said, the people in Second Life make, and I just saw somebody wrote an article about this the other day, they make about the same amount of money collectively as entrepreneurs as the, pla the company does on okay. the platform. So it's actually about 50-50. But, but there's one platform. Look at that. There's one platform. I think we've designed High Fidelity as an open source thing with, a, with an Apache license because we believe that it's likely to be a highly... Uh, independent uh, network of networks, that people are going to put up their own servers, and those servers are going to be city blocks or something like that, you know? And as you move around, you're going to be using a standard set of protocols, you know? Like, for your, what does your avatar look like? What's money? How does money work? Uh, how do I say that I own something? You say your watch belongs to you. Can you prove it? We feel like basic, some, some high-level things like that are probably going to be a standard. But then the actual experience that you have, you know, when you go into somebody's, you know, dungeon world or something, sure, that may be highly specific and proprietary even. But there's got, there's got to be some degree of standardization that, again, I, maybe I'm wrong because I started my career right when the Internet took off the web. And so, of course, I'm colored by that memory. But it feels to me like something like the web, more than something like we were talking about uh, uh, Mitch is, uh, uh, you know, jammed at, you know, the, yeah, the kind asking. of like the stack of controlled sh small number of applications that, you know, Verizon gives you. It, it feels to me more like a safer, better, bigger outcome is something more like the web. Okay. And so to understand and build on that, one of the things that you, that you said you're doing uh, with iFidelity is actually building a, a blockchain yeah. uh, type application. So... Um, and, you know, and, and many people know they say, well, the, the reason I know that blockchain doesn't make sense is this, if, if I can have another solution and get the same result without the blockchain, then there's no point yeah, in why would the blockchain. You do it? Yeah. So can you do what you want to do without the blockchain? And if not, why do you need the blockchain? I think it's a, uh, obviously I'm pausing because it's a complicated question. We went ahead and built a prototype blockchain system uh, which is used to store the money and the uh, object ownership information, the digital property information. I think, by the way, digital property, the idea of you owning a shirt or a car or a slide projector or whatever in the virtual world, maybe for bragging rights, maybe for a practical reason, the chairs that you use in a business meeting as avatars. I think indicating who owns all that stuff um, is a problem that is pretty well suited to a blockchain. It could be done, I think, and, and of course, we, you and I were talking about this, you know, as, as thinkers, uh, yeah. real thinkers of, of some, some extent on this subject, both of us. The, I think there are uh, versions of blockchains that are a little bit less big and public than the ones that we're most aware of now that are probably a, more, a, a better outcome for a lot of systems. I don't think you have to go all the way to a completely permissionless public system. I was just writing about this the other day, that the cost of transactions in these public systems is very, very expensive because of all the distrust you're supporting. So I think something like a blockchain that feels like a public database mm -hmm. is the right way for the metaverse to store information about assets. Okay. But I don't know if it needs to actually be the full Monty. So to build on that, because um, I mean, blockchain is becoming more and more fashionable world is the new is the new VR. <laughs> uh, it's it, starting it, to go yeah, into its own exactly but then it's, it's that, but, it, but in the games industry you're saying more and more you know blockchain based games and all this stuff and all that and so for people who are thinking about it or want to understand it what are the things that you're making sure about in your own blockchain from your own metaverse what are the things that you're making sure um, are key to its design and to, its be, and to it being scalable and all that that might be helpful to people that are thinking about these problems for their own games or whatever they're doing. Yeah, uh, well, let's just, let's just focus on one. I mean, because there's really just, there really kind of is just one, which is speed and scalability, that yeah. these blockchains are not scalable as yet, the ones that we've built. Uh, you know, the existing blockchains that we're familiar, the permissionless blockchains, which is basically Bitcoin and Ethereum, both of those blockchains have tens of thousands of nodes and they're incredibly slow and the electrical cost to make one incremental transaction is inc ridiculously high. I mean, there's no possible way that we could possibly in any sane universe do, do things that way. So I think scaling the transaction rate, transactions per second, mm -hmm. to something that a game developer could actually make use of, meaning you, know, you need something that has low latency and high transaction rate, 
that is critical. And unfortunately, like if you're thinking about doing stuff on blockchain, and we, again, we were, you know this too, there's nothing out there right now. I mean, the, and, and then you were talking about something yesterday, which I c completely agree with as well, that also the convenience of the user experience around like transacting on the blockchain, it's just not even there yet. I mean, don't, don't even start. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, so if you're thinking about using like a traditional, you know, blockchain wallet on Ethereum or something was your example, to do like an app on that, don't. I mean, it, it, we're not there yet. The, the difficulty of actually, of a normal person getting access to those tokens or whatever you were giving your example of is just incredibly high. So, so that's, that's why, so because of that, so that's why I was asking the question is, um, aren't you afraid this is gonna limit the potential adoption of what you're building with high fidelity? Yeah, I mean, I think with, a, with high fidelity, that people always talk about you know building the airplane while it's flying or whatever. I think it's more like almost with us where launching a bunch of missiles into the air with the hope that it, they all collide at the same moment at, at some point in the near future and create this amazing product. Like, I'm still waiting. I, I have to estimate when are the VR headsets going to be ready. You know, we, we, I just changed my estimate and we laid off some people at my company because I changed, I, we looked at that and we said, it's not going to be two years, it's going to be longer than two years to get any kind of widespread adoption of headsets. So we, we got to wait for the headsets. On the blockchain side, we got to wait for a fast public blockchain that we can probably use without having to reinvent too much of it ourselves. So there's that. I'm kind of targeting a point in the future. I mean, I think like a better, a good wallet, Facebook's Libra proposal, for example, uh, they're going to have a good wallet. I mean, it's going to be easy to use their wallet. So I, I, think, I, I think these things can be fixed. I don't think we have too long to wait. But if you're doing it today and you're like, about to, or you know, you're thinking about building a game that would launch in the next, you know, six months or something on Ethereum. It's not going to work. I mean, it's going to be too hard. Being a little bit provocative about how the metaverse can become mass market and how you're going to build. It. Of course, you know, you're you're talking about, you know, great things like getting people together, education all these things which are amazing. But if you look at most of the technologies, uh, what's really driven adoption is first porn, mm -hmm. then gambling, yep. and, then la and, then, and then games, right? Yep. Usually in that order. Yep. Why would it be different in the metaverse? I don't think it will be. I mean, I think there'll be, I mean, basic also just, just small economic advantage, right? Like if you think about what, what you know, what, what's the simplest thing you can do that has the maximum kind of economic gain, right? Gambling and, and porn mm -hmm. uh, are great examples of those. You know, the in initiative work can be done by a small group and then they can make a good bit of money on that. And so I think that in any open economic system, we're gonna always see the same sort of um, services and experiences being built first. So I do think that that will be true. Um, I do feel though that the, well, or I guess I wonder how large a system you can scale on, t on top of kind of just something like gambling and porn. Because I think that often they go along, like if you look at the classic example of the VCR or whatever, you know, they go together, they, they, they kind of help something get started, but then what actually gets started is actually bigger than those things, you know, which, you know, we use, yeah. we use YouTube today, <laughs> you know, video on the internet, obviously. Well, a big it's, part of the traffic is in the other you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right, the other tube. <laughs> Yeah. So, so that's 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 yeah, one of the, of the key questions. Um, okay, so you've just said that you know you've you've had to take some tough decisions because you know you need this this this, this kind of rockets to collide and, and all that for, for for certain things to happen. Um, if I was a game developer right now, and I was thinking about VR, um, I mean. What what would I do? I mean, is it sh sh is it is it should I wait? Should I start looking into it? Is um, I mean, what what would be your? Well, if you could build an experience like like gambling, for example, like mm -hmm. poker or something for real money. I mean, if you could find a regular regulatory way to do that or a way to avoid getting in trouble, if you could, if somebody could put on a VR headset and make five hundred dollars or thousand dollars. That's lots of money for you, I mean, some fraction of that, and then that's lots of um, reason, reason for them to go through the suffering of putting on a first-generation VR headset. So if you have an experience that's so compelling that it would cause somebody to buy an Oculus Quest right now, oh, you should do it. I mean, I think there's a huge opportunity. 
If, if, but that's if your revenue per user effectively is so high yeah. that the, the cost of the Oculus Quest is small. And by the way, I think education is an example of that. But I think there are other examples, and there are certainly game examples, right? Or entertainment examples more broadly that would justify the price of the device. But I think right now what we have to be realistic about is if you're offering people something that's casual, playful, casual, short form, single player, I, not to say it's impossible, but I mean, I think you just don't have enough terminal devices to sell that into. I mean, and we all know that. I mean, yeah. you guys know that more than I do. I'm not a professional. Yeah. You know, the, the small game world around these devices is just fascinating ideas, everybody going out of business, not making enough money to survive. And you think that's going to be the case for, I know it's a tough question, but for the next two or three years or the two next 10 years. years? Two to three years because... The next, the, the quest is pretty good. So, I mean, if you don't believe me, get a quest, right? Which yeah. you were saying, you believe me, we, we agree. Yeah. Now, the quest, is, the quest is, is, I think, the first VR device. How many do I've, you think it'll sell? It's a tough question. I have no idea. Yeah. What do you think? Certainly more than anything else before it, but probably more in the middle millions. What yeah. was the best-selling device until now? PSVR right at 4 million units, 4.2 million sold into the market. But again, that's a, ca that's a proprietary platform that's certainly very exclusively a gaming platform. Uh, on the Oculus Rift side and the Valve, you know, the, the Steam Index Rift, uh, everything, that looks like, you know, on the order of like a million or so units that are out there. But I think the Quest will do better than that. I think it'll do better. I, I would say, my guess would be that ultimately, say in the next year and a half, the Quest will outsell the PSVR. Okay, and because obviously you're at the forefront of this, right? Of 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 of, of, of building this VR metaverse. So, what are the steps that you're taking over the next three years, and where do you want to get to within the next three years? I wrote a paper recently. I said eight things to build the metaverse parts list for the metaverse. I think there's a bunch of big pieces that are pretty difficult technology problems. I find them inspiring, but they're admittedly pretty hard. Um, one is doing audio for large crowds, uh, because I think that's becoming going to become a requirement of all these systems. We talked about voice chat in the last session. Um, and, I, and I think that's going to be necessary. Yeah, because this is easy, right? But I guess if there's 50 other people yeah. in the same thing, it must be... Yep. We're a big technical challenge. Yeah, that, that's the thing that we've done. I mean, come and see me if you want to chat about it. Uh, we've, we, did, we did some really nice work with uh, doing 500 people's voices at the same time on a really big server, but just one server. We can, we can do everybody's ears, left and right stereo pair for HRTF for 3D spatialization of audio at the same time. But there's a whole bunch of other problems, like uh, large landscapes, large continuous landscapes. If people are going to embed their servers together somehow, you're going to end up with a scene that is really very large and has to be continuously progressively streamed and has to have some sort of continuous LOD uh, for stuff at range, especially on the lower end headsets. And so I think there's a big block of work there. Um, reputation, uh, identity is a very rich topic. We touched on that a bit already. Yeah. I think there's unfinished work on all that. Um, there's a lot of stuff, uh, just generally kind of running a large distributed network. If, if, if you're going to have a large space, you're going to end up using thousands or even tens of thousands of machines, even like the big games like Fortnite have to today. But you know, Fortnite doesn't do that all in one world. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. I think it's funny because people, people read about Fortnite. You know, oh my gosh, there was a concert in Fortnite, right? They believe that that concert was A, live, and B, live to what was it, live to 10 million people, which of course we, uh, those of us you know, working hard on this stuff, know it absolutely was not. We're not there yet. So you know, doing like a live uh, yeah, concert you know, that has 100,000 people, that's very important, unfinished work. Um, following on that, I'm taking it really left field. Uh, so you're doing like um, DJ like, uh, concerts or DJ parties yep. in, in what, is it weekly or? Uh, People do them weekly in World. Uh, we've done some bigger ones, like we had uh, Thomas Dolby as a headliner at an event where he got up on stage and put all the gear on. Uh, uh, it, so we, we've done bigger events that were, the biggest event we've done was about 430 people at the same time. So uh, more, than, more than we have sitting right here right now. And they were all kind of listening to the same DJ, dancing to that DJ. Yeah. and able to yell, dance, ask yeah. questions. And so, this is so. So I understand how you handle the um, 
the sound part. Also, how, how you under, how you handle the you know looking at each other, and it's also that you know my lips move more or less at the same mm -hmm. speed as when I'm talking. So all that gives that. What about touch mm. and movement? Yeah, I think touch is really hard. Now, movement, I think there is a valid. There's we've done some good work on that. It'll be easy to continue doing good work so that movement, body language, crowd, the feeling of being in a crowd, the feeling of moving with a crowd, I think is very doable. There's a critical factor, which is how long the delay is for you to see me move and wave back. Often when I'm in VR, I make people put, the, we were just doing this at their dinner there last night, I make people put their hands up, and mm -hmm. put them up on each other's hands and then kind of move and let the other person follow you. You'll find that when the delay is below a certain amount, about a tenth of a second, that feels very good. And if it's above that, you don't feel good. There's a lot of psychology research on that, on synchrony. Mm -hmm. What we're doing right now when we're talking and when we enjoy each other's company is we're kind of moving together like a rhythm. And you can't break that with too much delay. So you have to engineer the system so that the delay is very short, about one tenth of a second to about one fifth of a second, a little more. Um, and so, so we have to make that work to make uh, okay. it, it feel good to be in large groups. And, we have to, and then we have to do that for you know, 10,000 people at one time. And continuing with the metaverses, because obviously there's not just the, the VR metaverse, and since Second Life, there's been other virtual worlds, right? Um, sure. Some people could argue that Minecraft is almost like a virtual yeah. world, uh, and that's a pretty successful one. Um, some, there were virtual worlds for kids. I mean, Club Penguin was very popular at some point and then basically closed and all that. Right now, there's virtual worlds on mobiles and all that. I mean, what do you think is going to... Do you think the metaverse is all going to go to VR or there's going to be different types of metaverses still? There's a place for that experience where you're just watching a screen and, you know, and handling an avatar? Or is that just such a poor experience compared to VR that it's just going to disappear over time? I used to think that the way to go would be to be pure VR and to count on the VR headset selling so well that we could create an experience which definitely required that you, you, do, you know, kind of all in, that you have that the hand controllers, for example. Like I want to have a building system where I can you know, manipulate this bottle and you're only going to be able to do that with hand controllers and porting that back to doing it with a mouse and keyboard. I mean, that, that seems crazy. I would say, though, that my initial perspective on that was wrong because the, v the uptake on the VR devices is, so, is going to be so slow yeah. that it might be a better strategy to make something that's deeply inclusive. And, of course, being inclusive also has the benefit of being inclusive socially as well. That is, you're going to have a wider range of people that are available to have the experience if you can support, for example, desktops or laptops or whatever, not even graphics cards, right? Yeah. Mobile. So I now, I now think, and this is what we're working on right now, that... Um, uh, re-engineering the system to be a metaverse that has a lot of people in it over a bunch of different devices, you know, maybe because we're on stage and we're the people talking, we're the ones wearing headsets, okay, because we're going to be so much more colorful and interesting to watch, but everybody in the audience should be on a desktop because we can generate thousands of people in the audience if we only require desktop machines. If, we have a, if, we, if you try to build a business around virtual conferences and you have to have everybody have a headset right now, we are just not there yet. I mean, you are not going to get a large, diverse crowd. So do you think the key is almost like different levels of access of, and viewing of a deeper metaverse? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know exactly how to build that. I mean, I think there are real challenges to that. I mean, we know that here. But look at the success of something like Fortnite, right? Yeah. Wasn't its success driven by viewers platform reach? Yeah. But yeah. they had to make it work so that some somebody with a, I don't even know, I still, I mean, I've watched my kid play it. I, I don't know how you successfully compete, you know, on a mobile phone with a guy on a PC. You've got to be less than 25 for Fortnite. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to have fast fingers. You're more than 25, your reflexes don't work. That's my excuse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like watching kids type. I always say that the other I, problem... I the play other, PUBG, it's a bit slower. The, the other big problem with VR is it would, be nice if ki if, it would be nice if when mobile devices came out, we all started typing really slowly because it would make VR work better. <laughs> the big problem for VR is that fundamentally, you gotta, I, I think one of the big problems is you've got to be able to answer messages on this sucker. There's, does you, if you're wearing a VR headset, you've got to be able to get a text from your friend and respond to it, right? And to do that, you need a keyboard. You need to be able to read the text without your eyes bleeding. And then the second thing is you need to be able to type. And nobody has figured out either of those things. The first one's going to get done, I mean, I think. The second one, nobody has even designed it yet. I haven't even, I haven't even seen a design. I have some ideas myself. Come, come see me if you want to prototype some for me. I'll, I'll, I'll fund you. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing some ideas tried. But we don't have a good keyboard 
for VR yet that we can type at a reasonable rate, meaning, you know, say, uh, 40 words per minute. Shouldn't be a virtual keyboard? Just something in the air, floating in the air? I mean, people I already have know. tablets, right? You have tablets. Smarter people than me have worked on this so far, and nobody yeah. has done anything in midair yet. Even I, even, I think, if you're tracking the fingertips, just floating in midair, it's difficult to get to a coding speed of like 40, 40, 40 words per minute, 40 to 50 words per minute is what you need to get to, I think. And, it, and, and it's because you can type that fast on your iPhone. But on the iPhone, your, your fingers are hitting the glass. And that, I think that, you were talking about touch, by the way, yeah. and I didn't answer. That's Sorry. true. Yeah, touch. We don't have a solution for touch. Can we in hug VR? VR? Well, you I can hug. It? It's one of my favorite things. We, we've got a way to do that. Um, uh, I can give you a little bit of you know, vibration in the controllers, but no, I mean, we can't hug. Yeah. the way that we're used to it as human that's, beings. That's important for the other part of the adoption as well, which yeah, we won't talk exactly. about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's critical. Yeah. And I'm telling you, my background is in physics. And, um, so I, and I like nerves and the brain and everything. You know, I'm into all this stuff. I don't think there's a way to do this well. We're, we fantasize about it in fiction, but I don't think there's actually a way to do it. There's too much, there's too much information coming into these hands. Electric chargers? Not I've seen stuff, you know, there's some great companies like Ultra Haptics is yeah, an interesting company exactly. that's done that, but you can't, I don't know how to get their equipment like on every part of my body or even all of my hands where I can still freely move my hands. Yeah. So, Devices. So, I mean, we say that one of the big things holding back the, the, you know, the virtual metaverse is devices. And we say that, you know, Oculus Quest may be the first step to that. But you mentioned that, you know, that you actually have seen you know, actually something that you just can put, uh, like straight out of a Black Mirror and episode. Things, yeah, the, Lenses I mean, you can put in your eyes. I've that, seen, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen uh, a AR devices as well that, that, that have really, really bright, substantial displays. I think those are the most likely sort of near-term solutions that are going to change things. I think, I, I think the most important innovation that we have to see in the next two years' time will be that somebody will do a bright enough, wide enough field of view uh, pair of glasses that are see-through that can do both, you know, that meaning that they can do both kind of VR-like applications and, and more AR-like applications, I actually think we'll probably see a device like that come out in the next two years that'll be very exciting. Nothing like anything we've seen. Uh, the, 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 I'm not talking about the Magic Leap. I'm not talking about the uh, HoloLens. Um, those devices are much too small of a field of view, yeah. and you can't see the other person's eyes. So it's ridiculous. I mean, it's not right. something you would wear. No, no. So I'd love to be just, you know, a nice friendly hitchhiker in the wonderful metaverse and you know just jump from planet to planet and all that but i'm an investor and somebody's got to pay for all this yeah how do you pay for this how do you make money and i'm not talking you know i mean like in the next two or three years how do you start generating revenue the simple answer, I think, is that you monetize, um, I mean, in our, in our case, let me just say more broadly, the broad answer is you monetize uh, digital, ass, digital object sales. Okay. I mean, which, you know, as an investor, I bet you yeah. would probably agree that, that that's probably not a bad idea. Look at Fortnite. Yeah. So I think that if you can capture a small fraction of some sort of a merchandise sale of digital merchandise, that's got to be the future for all these companies, my, myself included. So we, we built our blockchain uh, marketplace system with the hope that we could capture a 10%, um, which we do for the limited sales that are going on experimentally on it today. We you know, capture a 10% fee on okay. the sale of a digital asset, the first sale of the asset. Subsequently, because it's on the blockchain, you can move it around, resell it and stuff without us making money, but we think that's fine. We think there's still a good enough business there. More practically in the shorter term, I think hosting, which is kind of like what we did with Second Life, that if, if, if people are going to do user-generated content and put up a lot of spaces, whether they're gaming spaces or teaching spaces or whatever, or, or work spaces, um, I think there's a very good business around providing the server space for them. And that's a business that looks more like Slack or something like that. So, because I'm conscious of the time, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I'd like to ask you one last question before um, I open up for uh, questions uh, here. Uh, so if you have any questions, please prepare them and, and be ready to ask them in the next, uh, in about two minutes. Um, let's finish on a high. <laughs> 10 years time from now, in 10 years, no technical limits. Yeah. Are we living in Oasis? What, what's high fidelity? It's got to be something like that. I mean, if you go 10 years out, right, we've, we've got at least one, we've got, what, two, two or three hardware 
cycles, right? Yeah. So if anything gets enough money, and maybe even the Quest by itself is already going to be successful enough to drive the creation of the Quest 2, right? Yeah. I mean, it's going, to make, it's going to make hundreds of millions of dollars. You guys as developers are going to make, in the aggregate, hundreds of millions even on the Quest. So uh, I think that we get, we, get, we get two or three devices out, meaning that we can read our email on them. And like I said, maybe it's mundane, and I think you're right. There's a, going to be a lot of fun that happens in the space between this, but there's going to be classrooms like Ready Player One. And my prediction would be in 10 years that we don't go to school the same way. And I mean even maybe, even maybe... Uh, K through 12 education. We don't go to school as little kids the same way because of these things. And that, I mean, that's... That's pretty big. That's huge. I mean, we, we cannot even begin to get our heads, including me, around the scale of that kind of an impact. And, and, I, and I think the posit positive nature of that impact, too. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to um, open up for questions. Uh, yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I think if we can get a mic just down here. Is, are there any other questions so I can... Manage time a little bit. Anyone else? You Please should. prepare. Yeah? You've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just uh, uh, say who you are and quickly your question, please? Yeah. Uh, my, my name? Yeah. I'm Walter Scherk. Um I would like to know, uh, in you knowing the industry, making games, knowing more than I, how can I support the virtual industry? Like, how can I make uh, Ready Player One a reality or maybe something like that? Maybe giving money to, to someone, making games for VR, maybe? Yeah. We'll start with, I mean, obviously the Unity platform for VR is kind of the premiere right now that everybody experiments on. But look at our stuff. Look at High Fidelity. It's open source. It's there right now. You can download the pieces, uh, the, uh, set up a server and experiment with building some content on it. So it's available right now. And I do think that we are the front runners in building a, a multi multiplayer, uh, you know, hosted environment. There are any other questions? Yeah, sir, please, just there. White t-shirt at the front. Could you pass the mic? Yeah, just there. Thanks. Um, hi. Um, you've used an analogy. Sorry, your name. Your name is. It's always nice to know who we're talking. To. Uh, I'm Mark. Mark uh, yeah. So you've used the analogy of um, the metaverse as a city where each block is a server with its own content, um, and you you talked about fractal structures. So you can go deeper and experience new content. But how much deeper is too deep, and how do you moderate the content um, so it doesn't become too much for the user? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that's right. Uh, how, how do we do level of detail and how do we do practical scale of interactive content and things like that to make it work for the user? Um, I don't know. There's a big economic challenge to that. I think, though, that, that I, I think that the spaces that are embedded within other spaces can present such a simplified view of what they look like from the outside looking in. I mean, obviously, this is LOD, but I think that can be done at the scale of servers to create a balance in the total number of machines you're connecting to at the same time, therefore the bandwidth and the uh, complexity of the rendering and simulation. I think it's doable, but I only can say that because we have designed some of it, but we haven't built as much as I would like to. I'd like to build more soon. We're, we're trying. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, the gentleman there. There's lots of questions. Uh, hello, I'm Carlos. Uh, when you were talking, when you were talking about uh, role playing and creating a metaverse uh, virtual world, I thought about like the kind of experiences that you get with classic the tabletop role playing. Do you think that you could ever come to a point in technology making a game which can work as a baseline to make experiences similar to role playing games, like in the same way that you have? a role play as a way of playing, you have systems like D&D and uh, Call of Cthulhu. Do you think that we could achieve that, a baseline which players can create systems so would they can <laughs> bring this kind of experiences? Would you invest in that, Alexis? I don't know. I, uh, I maybe. Yeah. We have a Dungeons and Dragons night that we do with the team. Uh, a, a subset of us, we're about 60 people now. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and that, we actually just use high fidelity. Just like sometimes we almost like do Dungeons and Dragons where we're sitting there 
rolling and playing. Like we, <laughs> you can do it at any scale. We're the avatars. But then we have some fun like effects and stuff. People will come and they'll build, you know, our designers. People will come and build crazy things like the, you know, some of the sound effects or things. And they'll make, make it more fun on top of that. But I, d I do think that, that that kind of like light role playing yeah. is a very powerful idea. And of course, it's not only me who thinks that. Uh, VR chat, which is one of the most successful uh, VR multi-user experiences to date, um, with you know uh, as many as five thousand or eight thousand people playing it at once, uh, they they've done a lot of stuff like that. I, I think it's I think it's a, both a good idea and a pretty uh, a pretty approachable idea for 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 gaming going forward. Yeah, no, I agree. Thank you very much. Um, we have we have time for one more. One more question. There one more question in the audience. Not every day we have Philip Rosel and Alexis yeah. Bond seated in our stage. There, this one last question, the gentleman there, please. Hello, I'm Hector. Uh, in a short time period, like two or three years, which are the real reasons for a potential buyer or client to invest in a VR headset or displays? Well, that's what I was saying. It's got to be something that is valuable enough to make you actually buy the whole headset. So $400 is the price on the Quest. You know, you, you were saying that. You know, what's the reason why they would do it? I think it has to be something like school that is so compelling, or dating, that is so compelling that it's worth buying. You know, the $400 headset for the only purpose, but to do that one thing. And I think for the next couple of years, that's the complicated math that I'm thinking through. I don't know whether we have something good enough yet to cause somebody to spend $400 when there aren't any other people there yet. So, uh, but I, but I, do, I do think that the idea areas will be things like um, they'll, they'll involve humans like we talked about. There's no, there's no way, I'm going to say, maybe this is a challenge to you guys all as gamers, there is no way that a single player game experience is going to make somebody throw down $400 and buy a headset. No way. There's too many good games out there already. So it has to be human contact of some kind. So that means it's going to be education, entertainment, you know, maybe adult, whatever. But it, it's got to be something that would make you want to interact with other living people across the wire um, in some fashion. And, enough, and it's got to be at least $400 worth of fun. <laughs> Philip, thank you so much for your time. I have thank one you. request of you, Ivan. I would like, if not the next one, the one after the next one, at least one of the next two or three game labs to do this Let's do in it. high fidelity in VR. Is that a deal? Depends on you only. If you can we make that happen? Compromise? Yeah. Can you make a compromise? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to do that. Let's do That's that next deal. time. Would you you think that would be cool? Yeah. Let's see how it evolves. Thank, you, Thank, you, very Thank much. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.